Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about how inflation reports this week could influence mortgage rates and what to expect for the second half of this year. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. It is wonderful to be here and out of respect for that wonderful USA basketball victory over Serbia. I'm going with my Pat Riley slick back hair look for today. Oh my gosh, you nailed it. Like when I saw it, I was like, it reminded me of Pat Riley. That's like the first thing I thought. So yeah, nice. So I got the hair to do it, but I, I rarely slick it back like this. But for now, <laughs> I will. <laughs> I like it. Definitely paying homage there. Um, okay. So I hope that, you know, we've had some really good stories on mortgage rates, but we have a spoiler potentially coming. So let's talk about inflation and what we might see uh, next week or this week if you're listening to it on Monday. So we're going to have two inflation reports coming out. And the reason I bring this up is one of the Fed presidents uh, this morning, she talked about, we're going to cut rates if CPI infl inflation keeps falling, which to the life of me, that's not their inflationary target. But they've been doing this a lot recently. And um, I kind of read into that in a kind of a Machiavellian way that I believe the Fed presidents really believe there's more disinflation in the CPI data because of rents and not so much in the PCE inflation. So you guys got to hear me out. This is not a, a conspiracy theory here. Uh, the shelter inflation for CPI is 45% of the index. The Fed never uses CPI as a target. It's usually personal consumption expenditures, PCE. Now, the PCE inflation never went up to 9%. It went up to 7%. Now it's 2.5%. Uh, and uh, there's, there's more room to go down on CPI. So I'm trying to like, I was trying to figure this out. Why are they talking about CPI more than they used to? I think they got a, all got together and said, hey, listen, there's going to be more disinflation in the CPI inflation report. Now, this actually happened uh, recently. Um, uh, if you compare CPI to PCE, the last reports, there was more disinflation from CPI, but that's traditionally not what they care about. So if something happens, and you have a very bad CPI report. Um, can that push bond yields lower from these low levels? Right, we're not we're no longer at four seventy on the ten year yield. I think right now, as of this second Friday morning, we're at three point nine three. But if that's the game the Federal Reserve wants to play, that you're you're playing you're playing cat and mouse with inflation data that's going to have a very you know hard base effect in the second half of 2024, meaning that, you know, the comps are going to be really tough to show noticeable year over year growth or decline. So you really need to start focusing on these monthly prints. And I, I believe that they're talking more about CPI inflation because they think that that has more disinflation and that can give them a little bit more cover on rate cuts. Uh, that's how I picked up on that because we've never used CPI. I mean, I, I always make fun of it that everyone loves CPI inflation, but it's not what the, not what the Fed tracks. So uh, I've, I've seen a few statements like this recently, <clears throat> and I just think that's, that's their game plan. So we'll see how the CPI inflation uh, report comes out. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking they really believe this is going to show more because the rent thing has lagged so bad uh, uh, out there that uh, uh, they're counting on that with the unemployment rate going up to really make a case for cutting rates uh, uh, and just starting that process, you know, not only for the second half of 2024, but also for 2025, especially if the labor data starts to get weaker. So in in this case, inflation could play a good role for us, right? Uh, for those in the mortgage industry and real estate that want to see the rates cut? You know, it, it can. I'm just assuming, let's just uh, hypothetical, it, it has a bad report, then, you know, like I said, you're, you're, you're playing with fire. When you, when, when you say inflation, CPI inflation, if you're using your rate cut model only on CPI inflation, which you've never done since the Peloponnesian War, <laughs> you know, 
it, it, it just sounds weird. I mean, to me, it's just like, I mean, I, 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 I'm a paper, rock, scissors, labor. We're only talking about rate cuts because the unemployment rate has gone up. And, 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 and that conversation itself is getting very interesting because the labor force has grown 4 million in two years. So that's how you could get the unemployment rate to rise. More people are looking for work, but that means more people are looking for work. So people go, well, the unemployment rate's only going up because of the labor force are true, but they're looking for work. <laughs> so if the jobs data is narrowing down to just a few sectors and you have some concerning data lines, especially in construction, it means something. So we're getting into a really, really funky, weird stage of what Fed presidents are saying in public and how economists are looking at uh, data and what's the next stage uh, could be, but they don't have to do any of this. Policy is <laughs> restrictive already. You could cut three, four, five times. You're still restrictive. So move it, just move it. But I, I, I it was curious to me that on a Friday uh, that was used uh, uh, instead of the traditional PC inflation data. You know, it's so crazy to me because I feel like, um, like you pointed out so many times, like this could be an easy win for them, right? Um, in the sense of like, it, there's nothing, they do, why do they need more confidence than what they currently have? Bureaucrats, academics, they're not soldiers. <laughs> they're not ball players. <laughs> they are, in a sense, somewhat almost like puppets. An institutional puppet, so they got the they have to come up there and they have to keep their dual mandate of stable prices and uh, uh, employment, keeping people employed. So that was the who spiked the Fed's eggnog. Something changed in 2022 because I pick up terminology, pick up sentence structures. There's you could just totally tell something changed, body language on how Powell was talking about, but. I believe, like I've always believed for the last two years, when the labor data gets softer, they feel better that if they cut rates and inflation is not to 2%, hey, in the employment, if inflation picks up a little bit, hey, it's employment, that dual mandate gives them cover, even if you have a few bad inflation reports. But again, we've gone from 9% CPI to 3%. Like if I go back to 1914, 3.3% is the average. We've gone from seven, a little bit above seven percent on PC inflation, down to two and a half percent. You know, uh, the PPI inflation was like fourteen percent, and it's come down to even negative on some of the data lines. So it's just cover. Cover. Well, while we're on the topic of the Fed, we had um, some interesting news come out of the press conference yesterday that uh, former President Trump gave, which he was talking about the. Um, yeah, a lot of topics, but when it came to rate cuts, he said he thought the president should have more direct influence there. And of course, when he was president, he tried to, you know, he he put Powell in place as chair of Federal Reserve, but then tried to pressure him quite a bit and is now saying that he thinks any president should have more control over interest rates. Is anybody else shocked? No, no. not shocked. It's just interesting because I, I do think the independence of the Federal Reserve, as much as it can be frustrating to people in different areas across the board, whatever you think of them, it's pretty important to, you know, the overall monetary policy, right? So um, I'm, I'm going to look at this in a coaching aspect. Trump is, in a sense, loves lower interest rates, real estate does better, and the dollar goes down. Um, that's what he wants. So uh, you kind of have to work the referee in public. When a coach <laughs> yells at a referee, hey, 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 hey. The co I mean, the, the, the coach can't make the call on the court, right? But he can harass the uh, referee so much that all of a sudden he gets a few calls his way. So think of Trump in that manner. He knows he can't do it. His staffers know they can't. They, they could try some legal things. It can't happen. But if you work them in public, especially with where inflation is now, um, hypothetical, let's just assume Donald Trump is the next president. I guarantee you he is going to go great cut galore on the Fed <laughs> every single day. He's going to say, look, inflation is down. You're, you're, you're 
ruining how he's going to work the referee. That's kind of what he does in public. That's how I, that's how I look at it. I don't see this as like a threat of independence. I just see a coach trying to, you know, push something and then the public gets to see it and then everyone's human. Do you actually make a move? So that, that's how I, that's how I view it. I don't view it as, you know, he's going to, he's going to have a direct authority. I mean, you, you'd have to do some really crazy legal things for something like that. So just, just look at him as a coach trying to work the referee for the game. I do think it's funny because at the end of that, he was like, but don't do it before the election. They should be cutting rates, but they shouldn't do it before the election. Is that, is that, is that shocking too? You know, (laughs) try to get the, I mean, you, you have to remember there's a, there's a lot of people that were very bearish on the U S economy and, have staked a career on a recession in 2022, 2023, and 2024, and it hasn't happened, right? We haven't had a job loss recession where industrial production goes down and real wages go. I mean, God, I could go so nerdy, Sarah, on economic data on how recession is, but I won't. So that hasn't happened. So what you need is you, you want the Fed to stay restrictive as policy to get you there. And people are seeing the unemployment rate rise. They're like, yeah, don't cut rates. Don't cut rates. When I'm in charge, Oh yeah, let's get cut rates. Let's do QE. Let's see. So right. humans, humans are humans, yeah. right? This is this is this is trying to win a game. So um, yeah, that, that, that it's not shocking that he said that, you know. So this is the world we live in, Sarah Wheeler. So it's we just true. gotta we it's just gotta true. play with the you know the, the 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 players on the chessboard and see what happens. And between here and the election, all bets are off, all sorts of things going on. So let's talk about um, what we're looking at for the rest of this year. So the second half of 2024, you've made a lot of statements about how it's so different than like last year or especially 2022. What should we be expecting between now and the end of the year? This is a very, very good economic discussion on housing. Um, The second half of 2022 was this historic, I mean, absolutely historic crash in activity. I mean, just the waterfall of waterfalls. You'll never see anything like this. And uh, what it did is effectively, uh, now there's weakness in pricing in the second half of every year. That's why if you look at the median sales price index, it goes up the first half traditionally, and it goes down. By the way, there are a lot of people who still try to do this grift about not show <laughs> Sarah, this is this is hilarious. They'll take the first half of the year and cut the chart out and go, look, home prices were falling in the second half of 2023. There's literally people who thought home prices fell 15, 20% in 2023. So they try this grift. It's YouTube trash, Twitter trash. But um, so this always happens. You have to realize that the the first, you know, six months of the year, the gains, and then the losses, and then we average out how the year ends. 2022 had authentic price declines, you know, there, and it wasn't because inventory was so high. It wasn't because monthly supply was so high. It was literally the greatest short-term shock that created the fastest crash in sales to where the products that were coming online for the first you know, few months of 2022, we're working off a three to four, possibly maybe at worst case, 5%, you know, mortgage rate. And then we went from five to six, six to five, five. To, the whole thing was c- complete chaos. Very sloppy, by the way. Um, but in that case, pricing actually did decline. Now, I think what I'm what I'm seeing is that people are not getting why aren't prices crashing because inventory is higher now than it was uh uh in 2022 monthly supply is higher the price cut percentages that we show on our data lines are higher but we're not seeing these big national home price declines yet now i since the end of march when when our data lines started to show inventory growth we said at least i said uh, the price growth data is going to slow, especially in the second half. The comps are harder and we're going to have authentic. Now, I haven't been right uh, uh, in that sense, but I still think by the time the year ends, uh, it'll it'll show up more in the data lines. It, it, I, it, based off of my forecast of 2.3% average nominal home price growth nationally. 
But I think what people are confused about is like, why isn't it declining more or why is pricing still so uh, uh, effectively high? And it's just, it's just one of these things where I, I, I was having this conversation with someone and I told the person uh, inventory was higher from 2014 to 2019 than where we are today. Monthly supply was higher. Why didn't prices crash back then? Person didn't know. Right, couldn't couldn't answer the question. We had higher inventory with more monthly supply, and then the I, I I was surprised the person didn't get it. I said, "Well, guess what? We had more home sales back then, right? The supply and demand equilibrium was sales were much higher, monthly supply was higher back then, inventory was higher, but that supply and demand equilibrium was stable. So prices grew, nothing spectacular in the in the past decade. Here." We have very low levels of sales. We still have historically levels, low levels of inventory, but we don't have sales crashing anymore. That's the difference, right? 2022, the second half had the fastest crash in home sales ever. So for those of you that might not have followed uh, our work in the second half of 2022, when everybody went, this was the peak of housing. The theory I had was just a theory, which you should never believe in a theory. You need to show it, that home sales were going to get down to 4 million. And this is just when we broke under 5 million. It was a crazy call, if you think about it. I said, we're, it, the four looking indicators look like me. We're going to hit the 4 million. And if it stops there and rates fall and demand you know, stabilizes, the whole 2022 story went away. And what happened? It literally got to 4 million. Exactly. Rates fell. The four looking indicators got better. And by the time people figured out the housing dynamics change, it was like six to eight months after the start of 2023. It's like home prices hit all-time highs. This is what you need to track going out for the rest of the year. But you can't use 2022 anymore because we went from six and a half million sales or around there at the start of the year down to four million. Here, 4.8, 4.38 million was the so far, the monthly sales high. That was the time where we wrote that article about saying, hey, guess what? Uh, I think this is the peak of sales, the monthly sales print. And so far, that's been true. Unless rates fall, I think that's it. But the the decline in demand just is not the same, right? We have like two and a half million in, in 2022. We just have a couple hundred thousand right now. So uh, price growth should cool down. I'll, I'll eat my words if it doesn't happen. But uh, it's it's also structurally not that kind of marketplace where home sales are crying. I mean, everybody that lists their house kind of also knows that where mortgage rates are, where payments are and everything. And again, if most sellers are buyers, then here it is. And we're going to have the second lowest new listings data ever recorded in history. So the days on market are growing. Inventory can rise. That's the whole higher mortgage rate thing. But the supply and demand equilibrium is so much different than 2022 because we don't have this waterfall crash in demand. So from your perspective, you know, is this going to be like, oh, okay, we're just going along? Or are there any big surprises that we should be worried about this year? So here's here's a hypothetical possible surprise. Now, there are people that say, well, mortgage purchase application data is not reacting uh, a, a, as well to lower rates. Okay, so let's just remember the last two times rates fell more than 1%. It was November, December, January. Purchase apps are very seasonal. So- Get the seasonality, January all the way to May after May volumes fall. Just a hypothetical. If rates keep on going lower, and so far out of the last nine weeks, we've had five positive prints and four negative prints. So it's actually positive because before that, we were all negative, right? It was a very negative year this year. If that occurs, you, we can have pending home sales pick up or sales pick up. See, I, I have to explain this because people still ask me, how did pending home sales like beat estimates? It was supposed to be down big. And I said, guys, guys, look at June. Look at June. Oh, wait a second. You don't read the tracker. I'm sorry. <laughs> how would you know? I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. It's okay. You wouldn't know. So we had three straight weeks of pause. And it, again, it doesn't take so much. So a hypothetical theory is that if rates keep on going lower and we still have these positive weeks, you could get sales to pick up a little bit and then uh, we get ready for 2025. That, 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 that would be a little bit different than what we've seen. And we are 
oh, oh God, talk about low comps. In October, right, uh, we, we are going to have some of the lowest year-over-year -year comps in maybe history, uh, especially on purchase apps. So don't be surprised if we have some positive year-over-year -year purchase application data, which we, I don't think, I, it's like two years since we've had a positive year-over-year -year purchase application data print, but it's only because the comps are so ridiculously low. So that is something that could happen. Let's just, mortgage rates fall below 5.75%. Demand picks up just a little bit. Just picking up just a little bit changes it because we're working from such low levels. So I want to jump in here and say that we are having an economic summit in 2025, early 2025. You're going to be our keynote speaker. We're super excited. We're getting a lot of people in there so uh, people can know like, you know, what to expect on all these different things. And the angle is going to be not just like information, but like, how does this information inform people's decision making on their business for real estate and for a mortgage? So super excited about that. Uh, mark your calendars. We're still looking at dates. But um, if it does happen that. in the month of February, that's that's enough time to get the forward looking data set up. Um, again, we I always heat mump, heat map uh, purchase apps second week of January to the first week of May. So if it does happen in spring, we'll have an idea, but also our weekly active inventory new listings data that nobody's going to get that information until months ahead. We also have a better idea of how spring looks in that. And again, toward the end of last year, when I kept on going on CNBC, I said, hey, listen, new listings data is bottom, new listings data is bottom. It's going to grow. And if it's growing, active inventory could grow. You have to like be careful of the mortgage rate lockdown person, you know, especially if her name is Sarah. And then just <laughs> we kind of uh, work off of that and move that forward. And guess what happened? Inventory grew. That's the best part of 2024 for me. So if I'm smiling a little bit more, it's because of that. And look what happened. Inventory grew nationally 40, but there's no 15, 20% home price crash, you know, new listings data, second lowest levels ever recorded history. These are how housing economic cycles have worked since yeah. the Peloponnesian War. We have data going back to 1942 here for some of these things. And it's just, we're, we're trying to get back to something normal and we need it to. If you wanted to have a functioning housing market, you cannot have inventory levels at where we were. And, end of 2020 all of 2021 and the early part of 2022 that that's savagely unhealthy <laughs> we no one wants that no one wants that to come back yeah we're looking at the maybe the second week sometime after uh, uh valentine's day in february so uh, it'll be interesting i think we're going to have it here in dallas that's where we're having our one day summits but um logan thank you so much for being on and thanks for explaining all the things that we need to know about inflation rates and more and just remember, you're a coach. You got to work the ref. Uh, working the ref <laughs> does good, especially in this day and age. So I would say talk to you soon, but um, I'm going to be on PTO next week. Uh, well, the, the week this comes out in Hawaii. So other people are going to be What's interviewing PTO? This week. Oh, is that like I, a vacation? I know. You don't game? know what that is. Is that, is that like a vacation? <laughs> like, do you like. Okay. I, I like think about this. Like, can I ever take 10 mm -hmm. minutes off? So you even, could, as far as we're concerned, it's your own, it's your own thing that makes you. On I know. I, 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 it, it's lovely. Everyone loves vacations, but I was thinking I, whenever I go traveling, it, I never stop. And I go <laughs> it, there. It's such a fear of like missing out on information, you know, that's, that's yeah. just like, I can't, I can't, I can't ever, I can't ever, I can't, I can't ever stop. I can't ever let it go. And, well, uh, I mean, it's great for us, but I, I do think you should take a vacation. I've told you this. Go take I, some PTO. I, I don't know. I don't know how, Sarah. I don't know how. I don't know. I <laughs> there there is no home out there for me where I could calm down. You know, I'm always going to be fighting this war, and I don't know how to stop it. That's what some guy told me. He said you you're you cannot you cannot function without fighting a war. You you literally have to do this. You wouldn't know what to do with yourself. And he's like, I was like, you're right. What would I do? I do. Well, uh, I'm excited for some of the guest hosts we'll have on Housing Wire Daily this week and especially uh, interviewing you. So I will see you later. Pleasure, Sarah.